Welcome to For the Birds with Richard Cole. Now, Richard couldn't be here today, but hello everyone, I'm Tran Bowie. Re uh, Richard isn't here in person, but we do have some great advice from him. So I will say I'm a little bummed I don't get to see Richard today. He's kind of a bird icon to me. Um, my husband loves birds, and so I am super excited about this segment because we are going to give some great gift ideas. Okay, let's get started. Great gift ideas for dads who enjoy feeding birds as well as Richard Cole's advice about foods that help birds during nesting season. And we are going to tell you how to take part in our upcoming Cole's Calendar Photo Contest. Some amazing prizes, we're gonna go into that a little bit later. So. Father's Day is June 19th. Do you have it on your calendar? Because it is coming up. So if you haven't gotten your Father's Day gift, Coles has all types of gifts for dads who feed the birds. Richard Cole has some great Father's Day gift ideas in this video. Any ideas for great gift ideas for dads? Dads who might want to get started with birding? I mean, you know, any particular products or food or anything that you would think of or binoculars, maybe? Oh, yeah. You know, what dad wouldn't want binoculars. That's always a, a good choice and get decent ones. I, I think probably the hundred, the $150 range is a good starting point for uh, binoculars that aren't just toys. And mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, just, a, just a nice, what I was talking about earlier, that getting started, just a tube feeder, a simple tube feeder, maybe with a, a, a dome over it, maybe with a tray under it and some good bird seed. I, I would recommend coals. And uh, just let them get started with that. I said, keep it simple. But if you're already feeding birds, you know, load up, get some more stuff, add some things to it, add another feeder. If someone's feeding birds, I don't know anybody feeding birds who wouldn't like maybe one more feeder after they've been doing a while, or two more feeders. And, uh, and, and the binoculars are good. And you may even consider if they're expressing any type of interest in what bird do I see, uh, maybe a decent field guide. There's one by Peterson's. Uh, it's been out for, he, he wrote the book basically on bird identification. And there's several others out there that show all the birds in the east or all the birds in the west. And it will give you a good way to identify what's coming. And it's, it's kind of nice once you get into it and start learning them. It'll take a while, but it's a lot of fun. And adds to the hobby. So we actually have two feeders at home. Richard is telling me that it is okay to add more. So we'll definitely be adding more. Also, another thing that he mentioned, if you're going to get binoculars, $150 is a great starting point so you're not getting a toy. So as Richard mentioned, many of us who enjoy feeding birds also want to identify them. A good field guide is the best way to help you do that. In this video, Richard has some specific advice about several good guides. As you'll see, any of these will make a great gift for dad. You always recommend a certain book that people can get to be able to see um, and read all about them, right? What is the book that you recommend? There's a couple of them out there. And first, I would I always recommend one with drawings as opposed to photographs of birds, although it's, it sounds counterintuitive. I don't want to see a photograph of the bird, but it's it's easier to show the things you should be looking for with a drawing as opposed to a picture because you can sit the bird up exactly the way you want to. But there was, there was a person who started field guides. In fact, the modern field guide was Roger Torrey Peterson, and his books are still available. And uh, it's called Peterson's Field Guides. For, got one for the Eastern United States, Western United States, et cetera. There's several other, Audubon has one out, and there's probably 10 others out there that are fine. And some of them have pictures, and uh, some of them have the drawings, and uh, National Geographic, I believe, has one. But if you have one that's got the drawings in it, I would suggest starting with the Peterson. And there's a one or two others out there that aren't too terribly complicated. Get it for your section of the country because that eliminates a lot of birds you don't have to worry about that, because they're not in your territory. And just start with it and go at it casually and just try to pick up one or two birds a week. And uh, you'll find that's a lot of fun. And after a while, you'll be very knowledgeable about the birds coming to your feeders. 
drawings instead of photos. That's really interesting. I would never have guessed. Richard also recommends getting binoculars to see the birds even better. They make great gifts. But how do you know what type of binoculars and what features to look for? In this next video, Richard shows us several models to choose from. Everybody should have a pair. Most people who watch Birds Care for Birds really do have a pair. And they're sitting around. Uh, crazy people like me might have four or five pair, one by each window, and a pair in the car, of course, just in case you see something while you're driving along. But what, what do all those numbers mean on binoculars? Uh, you see things like, uh, well, let me go on the types first. There's a thing called poro prisms, and I'll show you one in just a minute. And roof prisms, there's another nice term. That's the two main construction types of the way the lenses are aligned of binoculars. You get into other things uh, such as zoom and waterproof, and sometimes you hear uh, things like focus free, you don't have to focus them. And paddle focuses as opposed to wheel focuses. Real quick, uh, here is a, basically a standard pair of binoculars, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it is called a poro prism. You can see the distinctive shape mm -hmm. where it comes down, goes out, and down. So from the, where the two eyes look, they get wider. Okay. And there's a reason for that. I'll show you another pair though. These are called roof prisms. As you can see, they don't zigzag. They pretty much go straight through or apparently go straight through. And it's a different type of construction. A lot of people tend to think that you can make better binoculars with these because there's a more direct path of getting mm -hmm. view in there. They have their advantages, they have their disadvantages. But that's the two main construction types. And then there's uh, people say, well, what about the little ones? Here's a pair, and we're gonna show these in detail more. This is a pair of compact binoculars, not near as big. And is it a poro prism or is it a roof prism? Well, it's a reverse poro prism. Instead of the, from the eye thing, the binocular going out and getting wider, it comes in and gets slimmer. One way to make the binoculars like this very slim without going through the extra cost of making a roof prism that's a straight barrel. They are more expensive. So a lot of different things you can add to that. When you're out shopping, you can hear or see things like, uh, Focus free, that's a big term. You go in the store, oh, you don't have to focus them. They're focus free. That's really not a very good thing. It's fixed on the focal point. That's kind of like if you had glasses that were fixed and you couldn't change the focus, uh, as with progressives or something, you would be able to focus at mid-range, but you wouldn't see very well far out and you wouldn't see very well close in. The same way with the focus free binoculars, is a wide range of what you can see, but a much more you can't see well. So they're not good for delicate work like watching birds, something in small detail. Uh, then you have the way you focus them with a turning wheel, like this is, is what most people are used to. You just give it a spin. And some of them have just a flip focus, a little mm -hmm. paddle wheel that you just flip back and forth. There again, you won't find that on very expensive binoculars. It's generally on the less expensive binoculars and mm -hmm. people say, oh, this is easy, I don't have to do it. It, it, it's not as fine as the wheel turning. So you, you can see, but not quite as well. So there's some of the things I would avoid as for somebody watching birds. And why would there be a difference in, in regular binoculars and what you would use to watch birds with? If you're out just looking at the landscape, it's big, you don't know what a tree's supposed to look like. And if you see the pine cone or not, it doesn't matter. If you look at the mountains, it doesn't matter. It's a mountain. If you're looking at a bird or something with fine detail that may be very close or pretty far away, you need other capabilities in your binocular. You need to be able to see the fine details in that bird or you won't know what the bird is. I like to tell people, you're looking at a bird out in a tree. It appears that big to your naked eye, maybe. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking at it with binoculars, it can look that big to you. Yeah. That's a huge difference. It'll yeah. look 10 times bigger to your naked eye. Yeah. When you think about looking, if you see a cardinal, you know what it is. But if you see a bird that's not a cardinal that may have sort of the shape, maybe some of the color, you won't have a clue what that bird is. You say, maybe it's a cardinal, maybe it they don't look quite right. Pick up the binoculars, instead of getting an image this big of that bird, you're gonna see an image this big of the bird, you'll know what it is. Yeah. And you'll be able to identify 
especially the little warblers and things that have delicate markings and are a little harder to identify. Yeah. So that's, that's the reason you want to use binoculars, and that's why I keep one at every window. So, <laughs> so I, I don't, I don't miss do. something, yeah. yeah. Richard and Donna, I was taking notes in that segment, so definitely going to pass that information along to my husband. So remember, in addition to binoculars and guidebooks, Kohl's has some great feeders, including hummingbird feeders. Just go to Kohl'sWildBird.com to see our high-quality feeders. We also have all types of bird seed, including hot products that keep the squirrels from devouring your seed. You know what that's like. So a new feeder with some high quality seed also makes a great gift for dad. The birds are busy this time of year. The demand of feeding baby birds takes a lot of extra effort and energy. We know big energy for moms out there. You'll want to fill your feeders with food that is packed with calories to help these busy bird parents. Richard Cole has some advice for feeding birds in the summer in this video. It's that time of year and the, the, the adult birds and the baby birds are all looking for food. Uh, the little parents are going like crazy trying to find something to feed the little ones. And I have my personal favorite of thing to put out this time of year, especially this time of year. And uh, some of those include uh, like uh, suet products. And uh, now that it's getting warmer, the no melt type suets, uh, Coles hot meats and the uh, peanut butter or peanut, uh, natural peanut suet are good choices. They don't, they don't melt when it gets really hot. And the birds absolutely love this stuff. Uh, I'm going through a, one or two cakes a day right really? now because these birds are coming in, grabbing this stuff and taking off, and I'm sure they're feeding young with it. And uh, they've done this for years, so I know the stock will do it this time of year. So that'll be going on through the breeding season. My bluebirds absolutely love it. Uh, I think the male bluebird it seems like it's up here every 10 minutes uh, at the suet feeder. The other things also, we have the suet kibbles. Uh, they eat a lot of those. I have a bountiful bowl. Uh, one of the cold bountiful bowls. I hang two of those out. Uh, one of them, I just put a mixture in there and the other one, I put uh, dried mealworm. That's another very favorite this time of year. And also when it gets very cold, you'll see them hitting the dried mealworms a lot. The other one, the, the suet kibbles, a nice suet product, high energy, easy to digest, easy for them to eat. They love that. And also I throw in a few peanuts because the tip mouse always come in and get the peanuts. So, uh, you can put anything in these bowls, and that's nice, but those are some really good foods to use this time of year, uh, especially for the young, because they'll take it right back and feed the young. Lots of great products. As you can see, the birds are eating very, very well with coals. Uh, many of us use nesting boxes and enjoy seeing birds gather food for the young and then teaching them to fly. But it can be a challenge to get birds to use the boxes that you've put out for them. In this next video, Richard has some tips for attracting birds to your nesting boxes. Let's talk about um, the nesting boxes and what people need to do to get ready for their for the yeah. babies. Yeah, like I said, you know, nesting, all the birds don't use nesting boxes. A lot of people call them birdhouses. Nesting boxes is a much better term because they don't live in a house. They go in these cavities, nesting boxes, usually natural cavities and trees that woodpeckers carved out to have a protected place to lay their eggs and, and bring their young up to flying time. So nesting boxes are an important part to help these birds with their natural cavities are gone because we tend to cut down all the dead trees around us. So that eliminates a lot of their natural nesting areas. So put up bird houses, nesting boxes in your yard and two or three is a good number to have. A lot of people will put up one. You know how people are shopping for houses. They'll come and look at an entire subdivision and say, like, no, not this one. I don't like the corner. Maybe, no, I don't like that. There's the one right there. You need choices for these birds. They, they follow a pattern similar to that. They look around. You can tell, yes. They and, will go and look at one and then look at another one. And they really, it does remind me of just like we do. We go yeah. and look at a house and then they'll, and it seems like one will go get the other one. And the other one will check out the houses. In a lot of cases, the male will select a place and show it off to the female. Of course, she actually makes the final selection. That's pretty much the way we do it too, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. He's pretending like he knows what he's doing. So they'll, they'll pick out this one. You never really know. We can read the books 
about what they want, where they want the birdhouse, how high it should be, which direction it should face, how, what color. They don't read the books. They, in general, will follow what, the, what we recommend, but you never know. So put out several boxes. Put out three or four. Sometimes something will come along and start to claim a box. Here comes your bluebirds. The box is being taken by somebody else. They'll move on. If you got another box, maybe they'll take it. Sometimes the ones that started this box won't even take it. They'll do what we call a fake nest or a starter nest or, or something will happen to their mate. They don't finish it. If you have several nest boxes, you've got a much, much better chance of getting birds nesting in your yard. I do think bluebirds are, yeah. most people really, really want to attract bluebirds. And yeah. my husband and I were just so anxious to have bluebirds. But you, you really have to be patient. Mm -hmm. sure. For one thing, um, it does take them a long time, it seems, to decide. Like the first year, we put out two nesting boxes, mm -hmm. and we sat out there every day to try to see when the bluebirds would nest, and they didn't. And then and another bird came, you know, mm -hmm. and nested in one of the boxes. But now they do every year. So mm -hmm. it's like it's, it's a lot of effort and patience to get them. But then once you do, mm -hmm. it's like they are very loyal yeah. to you. Yeah, they are, and they'll come back, like you said, year after year. And in the case of the eastern bluebird, they will nest two, three, sometimes, or it gets four times during the breeding season during the summer. So that's a lot of bluebirds you get to see raised and, and fledge out of the boxes. It's so exciting to see yeah. them, yeah. you know, fledge and that sort of thing, and to be teaching, and then to bring the young ones to the feeders. You can tell them, you can see them teaching them to come yeah. to the feeders and everything. Yeah. So it is exciting. Tell us yeah. some of the products that you need to put out to attract them as far as the food. Well, the bluebirds are not traditionally, I'll say traditionally, seed feeders because they don't have bills that can really crack the seeds, like a lot of the small birds. Uh, chickadees and titmice have a very sharp pointed beak. They can, they can poke holes in the seed. Cardinals, of course, have the big conical beaks that can crush seeds. They have no trouble eating hard-shelled seeds. But the uh, bluebirds are not built for that. They're built to eat berries and insects. However, if you feed a really good quality bird seed like coals with a lot of sunflower meats in it, that's without the shell on it, They'll eat those just like little insects. They love it. The other thing, of course, is suet. Suet is rendered fat. Uh, in some cases, uh, they'll, they'll use other ingredients, like flour or cornmeal, and then put peanuts and things in it. So we have four varieties of, of uh, the, uh, of the suet, of right. the suet uh, just for the bird. Two of them are very good in the summertime when it gets really hot because they're made with dough, a lot more flour in it, so it doesn't melt as easy in the hot sun. And the other two have a lot more fat content, which are great this time of year. So you've got four products to choose from. All of them are great for the non-seed-eating birds. And of course, the seed-eating birds will help themselves also. But that's, if you have bluebirds and some of the warblers, put the suet out. Also, most of the Coles bird seed blends have sunflower meats without the shell. And like I said before, a lot of the birds who can't eat uh, bird seed, because they can't crack the shell, will certainly eat the sunflower meats, and they love it. They'll look like they spend their entire day at the, at the feeder with the sunflower meats in it. And uh, two of the best things you can put out, a good blend with heavy sunflower seed meats in it and suet. And also we have dried mealworms. Uh, Coles puts out some dried mealworms, not the little ones that crawl or live, but they're dried, so they don't move, and they're easy to, to use. They're clean. Just put them in a little bowl, and the insect eating birds, of course, will go to those readily and you'll have a captive audience for those. Absolutely, they yeah. love it. I think you can't go wrong with the, yeah. that combination. Yeah. Now that you know what foods you need to attract birds to your nesting boxes, you might also want to know the best placement, especially if you can't purchase several boxes. Placement is so important because you'll also want to avoid anything that can allow a predator to get to the baby birds. And if you want to attract bluebirds, you'll want to give them more space. Richard has more in this video. Talk about how far you might want your nesting box from your feeders, especially if you want to attract bluebirds, and how far they might be from I don't know, should you have them near trees or out away from trees? I see them out a lot of times just completely with no really trees around, maybe 10 feet away, but, you know, out in an open field. Well, for bluebirds, eastern bluebirds, uh, and all the bluebird populations, yes, very, very wide open spaces 
are great. That's where these guys want to be and feed. They'll be at a tree line, and they'll use tall things out in open fields, fence lines off to sit and perch and look for food, like I was saying. Uh, so put your box. Uh, I like bluebird boxes mounted about five foot high, not much lower than that, because I do like to put a baffle on to stop predation from raccoons especially and for snakes. Uh, but if you don't have that wide open thing, put it where you can get some sun, the morning sun especially. Uh, and they don't mind it getting hot, but they like to have it in a sunny location. I've heard a lot about whether it faces north or east or south or west. I haven't seen in practical applications that it mattered too much. There was some of that is, is about well, the prevailing winds are from this direction and it might take the rain in the hole, but I don't know if it matters too much. Put it where you can put it. The biggest thing is use more than one. It's like you going shopping for a new house and you see the one on the corner, everybody else really, oh, that's a great house. It might not appeal to you. You might want one at the end of a cul-de-sac. So the birds are somewhat the same way. I, a long time ago, quit trying to second guess them on where, where they wanted the nest because I, uh, I'll tell the story often that I had my box in a perfect place in the front yard and a neighbor two or three doors down had theirs in the backyard in the shade and that's where the bluebirds went. So you just don't know. But yeah, open sunny location is great. If you're looking for chickadees and titmice, same kind of thing, they'll go there. Uh, at, the wood, at the wood line, it's a good place too where they get part sun and they're not too far from the trees. So another thing that my husband did to try to attract them is to take like a branch because that's how they, they eat. Like he just stuck a, a dead tree branch into the yard nearby so that they could sit there, scout, you know, for, for bugs and go down to the ground when needed. And they really use those. It was funny. My neighbor, our neighbors said like, why is Ron doing that? Putting out, you know, <laughs> dead tree, like that's not going to grow. But the bluebirds knew exactly what it was for. Yes. Yes. And you can do something like that real close to your nesting box. Of, well, not so close that a squirrel can hop on it and hop right over to the top of your box. If you have a baffle on the pole, you don't want any predator to be able to get there. But if it's five or 10 feet away, it's a perching place for them. They love that. They like to stage and watch before they go in and out of the nest at feeding time. Richard, I would have never thought about, I always think about whether or not the snake, a snake could get into uh, the box. And I know that's so important. We have some vines outside. We have to always cut them back, make sure that we're not giving a snake an opportunity to go <laughs> up that pole, right? But I never right. thought about an animal reaching their arm in there and yep. grabbing something. So they probably want to get the eggs, right? Or Absolutely. Yeah. Raccoons yeah. Uh, can do that. And sometimes uh, if I'm talking to people about they've had a problem with the nest, I can ask them a few questions to find, pretty much tell them what got in the thing. If, if you open your nest box and the nest is destroyed and parts should be pulled out the hole, you're looking at a raccoon nine out of 10 times. That's what got to it. Uh, if the t nest is totally understory, the eggs are just missing and everything looks perfect other than that, probably a snake went in and took the eggs. So two ways you can tell that. And snakes can climb poles, they can climb pipes, and certainly climb wooden things and trees. So uh, yeah, get, put them on a pole, put a baffle on that pole, uh, like a good squirrel baffle or the raccoon baffle or a tough bird feeder guard to stop the snakes and raccoons from getting up there to the birds. And uh, you'll have a lot better chance. You might not have a problem with predation, but it, what you do, it, it's kind of, you don't like that. It's not a good feeling when you see that. And, but if that does happen, just make sure you protect them the next season or later for that season, they may come back, start over. We also want to let you know about our 2023 Coles calendar photo contest. It is going on right now. Now here's the deal. You do not have to be a professional photographer, but we would love to have your high resolution photos. We are taking your submissions right now on our website. So just go to coleswildbird.com, scroll down to the bottom to the information about the contest. As you can see here, you'll want to read through the rules and the suggestions. Also, this is the fun part. Take a look at our first, second, and third prize gift packages. The first prize, gets a package of feeders and products that are worth more than 350. You can see there lots of great stuff. The second prize will let you sample all types of Kohl's products as well as some of our specialty feeders. That is worth 250. So still a great prize package. 
Now the third place prize features our Titan tray feeder, as well as the Hummer high rise and all types of Kohl's food products. That is valued at 150. So no question about it though, our winners really love seeing their photos in our calendars. It's a beautiful calendar. We keep getting more entrants every year, so get your entries in. We especially love seeing your pictures in any season with birds eating our Kohl's products. So that does it now for our Facebook Live show. Richard Cole will be back here live and in person next month, so you do not want to miss it. And we are going to leave you with some pictures of our current Kohl's calendar. I'm Tran Bowie. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next month. Hello, this is Richard Cope.